A brutal and sweltering heat wave is impacting large swaths of the country this weekend. Temperatures are expected to break records today in states across the northeast and the middle of the country as cities brace for heat indices of 100 degrees or more. CBS News senior national correspondent Mark Strassman is in Tampa Bay with this report. There's this southern expression even Satan's sweating today. It's too hot. It's too hot right now. This is hot. This is brutal. Brutal. Better get used to brutal. Today's blowtorch forecast, lots of triple digit highs. Heat alerts again for more than 80 million Americans. For many of them, that heat is considered dangerous. Places like Texas, where this heat wave feels like a siege of standing right next to one of the wildfires burning near Fort Worth, or California near Yosemite. More than five dozen communities in, in 20 states this past week hit record highs. Take Tampa Bay, hit for most of the last week by hot, humid winds off the Gulf of Mexico. The daily high for the feels like temperature between 102 and 107. Texas and California had highs of 115. Overheated people in Dallas hunted for air conditioning anywhere. Libraries seemed cool again. Geoscientists blamed inaction on climate change and warned hothouse summers are here to stay. These are spectacularly tough things and they're only going to get worse unless we tackle the problem with everything we've got. Europe's week of heat was historic and deadly. Thousands died, most of them elderly. Wildfires in Spain. In the UK, where central air is rare, temperatures reached 36 degrees above normal. Portugal's high, 117. On both sides of the Atlantic, people have shared triple digit misery. And talking about the weather has meant more than making small talk. They should take it seriously because heat related illnesses can be life threatening. That was Mark Strassman reporting. We turn now to Miami Mayor Francis Suarez. He is a Republican and the current chairman of the U.S. Conference of Mayors. He joins us from Miami. Uh, Mr. Mayor, good to have you with us. Uh, you just heard our reporting there. You know, in this 2,000 page report the U.N. put out earlier in the year, it refers to Florida as an example of a place where the impacts of climate change are already being felt. Um, and it mentions people are likely going to have to move away if they live on the coastline. You and your city have had to come up with a strategy and the one released would spend 4 billion, 3.8 billion over the next few decades to build seawalls, take other measures. That's quadruple your annual operating budget. Can, can you afford what's coming? Well, first of all, Margaret, uh, it's not theoretical for us in the city of Miami, uh, it's real. Uh, we deal with it uh, day in and day out, year after year. Um, we've be, uh, been dedicating a tremendous amount of resources, updating our building codes over decades uh, since 1992 when we had a 200 mile per hour uh, hurricane event called Hurricane Andrew. Uh, now our latest challenge, of course, uh, is the water uh, and the heat, uh, as you've said in the prior segment. Um, and we, uh, our citizens approved right after Hurricane Irma in 2017, which created a four to six foot storm surge in our central business district, uh, a plan called Miami Forever. And the basis of the plan is to spend hundreds of millions of dollars that were voter approved, mm -hmm. it was actually a voter approved tax, and combine them with other funding sources like the state and yeah. federal government uh, to be able to, 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 to uh, upgrade our infrastructure to deal with uh, all the things that are being thrown our way from mother nature. But when you said you can't afford not to take it seriously, I wonder if you think the National Republican Party takes the problem of climate change seriously. Well, what we're seeing at the national level is that the only uh, action that is uh, occurring is, is action that's taken in a bipartisan basis. Uh, the Democrats, unfortunately, have failed uh, to be able to pass uh, bills uh, to address climate uh, at any sort of scale. So uh, the infrastructure Well, they don't bill, have any Republican votes. They also don't have all Democrats on board, but it would right. help if they had Republican votes. Yeah, exactly. Well, but I think what it means is that it has to be bipartisan in terms of their outreach, in terms of their messaging, in terms of, uh, you know, which is how they passed the, you know, the $1.2 uh, trillion infrastructure mm -hmm. bill with, with Republican votes. Uh, and we still haven't seen uh, any funding from that bill, by the way. Um, like I said, we've uh, dedicated $200 million in funding from our city residents. Why not? Residents, which, 
I, it's a great question. Um, you know, they have a, a great infrastructure, uh, Azar, which is uh, a former mayor of New Orleans, uh, uh, who was the president of the U.S. Conference of Mayors, uh, who we work with, but we still have not seen a penny of that money uh, trickle down, uh, percolate down to the cities, and we need it because, as I've said, we've dedicated a couple of hundred million dollars. Yeah. We've gotten about 30 or 40 million from the state, uh, but we need significantly more than that, as you've uh, indicated in your initial comments. So uh, there was this $2 trillion American Rescue Plan that passed back in the spring um, with zero Republican votes. Florida did benefit. Uh, Republican Governor DeSantis allocated over $400 million to help coastal communities in Florida. Um, so have you gotten that money in your hand? Um, and how much more do you need exactly? Yes, we have. Actually, the American Rescue Plan, ARPA, as you, as you describe it, uh, it's coming in two tranches, $950 billion last year, $950 billion this year. Um, and we have allocated it uh, effectively. Uh, and we are trying to leverage the money that we have uh, to do things like, uh, you know, uh, increasing our seawalls, uh, uh, valves, tidal valves that prevent the backflow of water into our city uh, mm -hmm. during, uh, during storm events, uh, pump stations, uh, which we have uh, built more and more and, and, and are planning to build uh, significantly more. So we yeah. are addressing the issue head on. Um, and certainly the, the funding that, um, that we're going to be receiving from the state and from the federal government, hopefully eventually from the infrastructure bill, is critically needed uh, for us to be able to tackle this problem okay. and make sure that we have Miami forever. So we mentioned um, you are a registered Republican, mayor of the second largest city in Florida. When you were on this program last back in January, you told me that you had repeatedly reached out to your governor, fellow Republican, to talk to him about health precautions you wanted to take in Miami, but you had no contact, no outreach. Um, and I wonder what you think that says about Ron DeSantis's executive leadership in a time of crisis. You know, uh, we, we are we're different. Uh, we have different perspectives and different uh, personalities and, and different philosophies uh, in terms of, of our leadership style. Um, you know, we, uh, you know, I, we, I lead, the, like you said, the largest, or arguably the largest urban city in, in the state. Um, and his uh, mandate is, is significantly greater in, in terms of number, but it's also very different uh, in terms of cities and rural areas. Um, you know, so. Does he talk uh, you to know, you now? He, Does he talk to the mayor of the second largest we, city in the state? We, we, we do. We have spoken on a variety of occasions. In fact, one of the ones that we spoke about recently happened to be about resiliency. We actually, the state uh, did give us about $40 million that we combined with the $200 million, and we did a press conference together mm -hmm. uh, in Broward County. So on, on the environment, I have to say, uh, his record uh, over the last four years, including the legislature's record, uh, has been very much pro-environment and something that he and I share. What about on issues of health? I mean, when it comes to COVID, Florida's response has been heavily scrutinized. Monkeypox, right now, uh, Florida has the third highest case count of any state in the country. Are you in Miami getting the vaccines you need? Are you getting the testing you need? Has that part of the health rollout working with the state been smooth? You know, we're monitoring uh, uh, this outbreak, uh, as, as, as you mentioned. Uh, I am not aware of any shortages in vaccines or testing at this particular juncture. None of it has uh, been, uh, you know, come to my attention. But certainly we'll work with the state and certainly we'll work with the federal government to make sure uh, that our city is protected and that those here get the necessary testing and vaccination uh, mm -hmm. to protect themselves against the monkeypox uh, virus. All right. Mayor Suarez, thank you for your time today. And we'll be right back. Today marks five months since Russia launched a full-scale war on Ukraine. The invasion has cost tens of thousands of lives, and it has roiled the global economy. For a look at where the fight stands now, we are joined by Ukraine's ambassador to the United States, Oksana Makarova. Madam Ambassador, it's good to have you back on the program. Good morning, and thank you for having me. I want to ask you about what just happened in the past 24 to 48 hours. Um, there's an estimated 20 million metric tons of grain stuck in Ukraine, can't get out. This is contributing to food inflation and food shortages around the world. So less than 24 hours after signing this UN broker deal um, to allow Ukraine's grain to export, Russia sent missiles into the Odessa port city where that grain would be transiting. This is what the State Department says. Your government said it's like spit in the face of the UN and Turkey. But you're sticking with the deal? Why? Well, what happened in the port is so Russian and it's very telling about what has been happening for the past eight years. 
For the past eight years, Ukraine always acted in good faith and tried everything possible and sometimes impossible to end the war and to return our sovereignty. Similar with this 151 days. We are defending, we are standing strong in defending our country. And at the same time, we will find any options in order to resolve the crisis. It's like this food crisis that Russia has created for other countries, not only for Ukraine. Mm -hmm. So we will do everything in order to perform and fulfill our part of the deal. Now, when Russia is violating it, they are clearly showing who they are and that they need to be stopped. So is Russia technically violating it? Because unnamed UN officials are quoted as saying it, it, they may not have because Russia never pledged to avoid attacking the parts of the Ukrainian ports that are not directly used for grain exports. Really? It seems like a pretty big oversight. Well, let's call it what it is. Uh, everything Russia is doing in Ukraine is a violation of pretty much every international law. Attacking a, a, a sovereign country is a violation. It's a war crime. So um, we have the deal with UN and with our colleagues uh, from Turkey. We are fulfilling that deal. They agreed also with Russia, and they have to first stop the war, you know, and they have to do everything without even any initiative signed. Mm -hmm. But with this, I think they're just showing their true face again. So the good response to that should be more weapons to Ukraine so that we can defend ourselves, we can get them out from our country, and we can unblock our ports and unblock all Ukraine in order not only to ship the grain, but the sunflower and everything else that has been uh, stuck in Ukraine. Right. That impacts your baby formula. That impacts Absolutely. foodstuffs for, for everything. But, but does this attack make, it, make that food crisis worse? Will this hurt your ability to export what little is getting out? We will do everything possible, and we are exporting even now through the western border, of course, uh, the capacity, through land. Mm -hmm. through land, through railroads, through all possible uh, uh, ways. And we will continue doing so. Our farmers are even planting and harvesting under the fire. So we will, as we defend the country, we will continue also to rebuild at the same time and plant and do everything possible to feed us and feed the world. Hopefully, and we see already good results of the new high marshes and artillery being provided to us, that will allow us to go on, to, on the counter offensive and free our territory, which we need to do not only for grain, but also to save our people. So your first lady was uh, here in Washington and addressed Congress and specifically asked for air defense systems. We know the U.S. has pledged to send national advanced surface-to-air missile systems, but they haven't actually arrived in Ukraine yet. Is that what she was referring to, and what specifically are you asking for? Uh, yes, very uh, effective uh, visit of the First Lady and her message that while Russia kills, America saves, I think have been heard by everyone here. And yes, we're talking about the NASEMs and other uh, defense systems. We're also talking about more firepower, more artillery, more uh, high marses, which just last Friday we heard the announcement of more coming. These are precision gun rockets. Exactly. And we already see that with that uh, equipment that is very effectively used by our defenders, we are able to destroy the um, ammo dumps that Russia is creating on the uncontrolled territories and that we actually are moving into freeing more territories in the south and hopefully with a sufficient number of weapons we can do the same in the east. But the situation remains very, very difficult still. It, it is. And we know now U.S. intelligence says Russia controls about 20 percent of correct. Ukraine. I, I want to make sure that I bring this up with you because it was so deeply disturbing when I heard it. Um, a State Department official, Ambassador Toria Newland, said Russia makes orphans and then it steals orphans. She said up to a thousand Ukrainian children have been stolen and given to Russian families. What exactly is happening? What can the U.S. government or the American people do about it? It has been one of the key pleas of the First Lady here. On all uncontrolled territories from Mariupol to other places, Russia is forcefully de deporting not only adults and families, but specifically children. And Russians themselves already admitted that 350,000 children have been evacuated, as they say, but kidnapped, let's call it the way what it is, to Russia. They have relaxed their own legislation in order to allow them to be adopted quickly into Russian families. This is a brutal violation, not only of international law, but of a common decency. How can you steal 
our children and try to try to hide them somewhere in Russia. Only 47 children we were able to return to Ukraine uh, right now. And as of April, uh, August 1st, Ukraine will be starting a platform, Children at War, which will allow people throughout uh, the globe, including Russia, to uh, add information there about all the children. It's our first priority to locate, find them, and return them. And it's very difficult because we don't have control over these territories. And do you have any hope that you can actually return these children without the United States or other countries getting involved? We need everyone who can to get involved. And I can assure you that everyone in Ukraine will not rest until all of them are located and returned. Ambassador, thank you very much for your time. We'll be back in a moment. We now want to turn to Commerce Secretary Gina Raimondo. Thank you for joining us. Thank you. So you have been making this big push for this CHIPS bill that would direct about $50 billion towards the semiconductor industry. Those are those computer chips <clears throat> and phones and dishwashers, and weapons, and basically everything. Yeah. The bill now also has about $200 billion in additional spending, which I understand you would play a role in helping to dole out in some way. For people at home, why should U.S. taxpayers subsidize a profitable industry? Right now, we are dangerously dependent on other countries, mostly in Asia, for our supply of semiconductors. We don't make any leading-edge semiconductors in the United States. And those are the sophisticated chips that you need for military equipment and high-end computing. We buy almost all of them from Taiwan. So the reality is um, we need companies to expand in America and, it, and other countries all around the world are providing incentives. But doesn't rolling out state subsidies of private industry create a dangerous precedent? Or are you arguing we're just in a scenario where we need to start thinking of vital industries as partially state funded or subsidized? Yeah, what I'm saying is this is a matter of national security and I don't think we can put a price tag on it because we are in a very vulnerable spot. So uh, if you talk to the military experts or the national defense contractors, you know they'll tell you they need chips. There's mm -hmm. 250 chips in a Javelin launching system. And that's not as sophisticated as some of the new equipment. Uh, There's a long list of things Congress needs to get done in a very short period of time. That. Are you confident that the votes are actually there to get this passed? Yes, I am. 16 Republicans voted yep. to move along with this, but this is still not done. And, and it's being tweaked here. So I want to ask you about some of the things that have been proposed. You have um, skeptics on both the right and the left mm -hmm. for this, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Bernie Sanders uh, has said um, he doesn't like it. It's a blank check to profitable companies. Mm -hmm. Rick Scott of Florida, Republican, has compared it to corporate welfare. Uh, a former labor secretary from the Clinton administration called it pure extortion. Hmm. That doesn't sound like this is truly bipartisan, as you called it. This sounds like this is fairly controversial. Yeah. Um, I, no, I don't think so. I mean, it's clearly bipartisan. You don't get 64 votes in the Senate uh, every day. Right? But on and this final bill, you think, despite these detractors, this will be it's a going to big pass. bipartisan vote in the House and the Senate. Yes, mm -hmm. I believe so. Now, also, I fully dispute Senator Sanders' characterization of this, it isn't a blank check. There are many strings attached. Mm -hmm. Strings attached, uh, companies can't use this money to build facilities in other countries. Companies who accept this money can't then turn around and be building facilities in China for leading edge technology. There's a lot of strings attached around uh, you know, the quality of jobs that have to be created, working with uh, small contractors and minority-owned contractors. There are labor protections. So to say it's a blank check is just dead wrong. Are those sufficient, though? Because you have yes. Marco Rubio of Florida coming out and arguing high-tech chip production um, should be further sort of restricted here on the national security portion. He says that um, corporations that receive the funding cannot expand chip production in China, but there are some things grandfathered in that are loopholes here. I mean, are there other places you need to tighten up stricter export restrictions, for example? Yeah. We always have to be looking at our export controls. So I would say I feel very comfortable about this bill. It protects national security and protects taxpayers. As also, written. as written, as written, there are 
there are taxpayer protections, it'll be a competitive, transparent process, and, and there's clawback provisions. Mm -hmm. If we give the money to companies and they do or not supposed to, we're gonna take the money back. I mm -hmm. feel very confident around the taxpayer protections and the China guardrails. For other industries as well? Absolutely, for all technology. We have to do everything we can to make sure that our leading edge technology, whether it's in chips or artificial intelligence or other areas, can't get into the hands of the Chinese. So you're open to further export restrictions? Yes. On Taiwan, because you know, embedded in this is the assumption that Taiwan is at risk, mm -hmm. potentially of annexation by China. How confident are you uh, when you get briefed by U.S. intelligence that this is an immediate threat? I feel confident in saying it's not immediate, and mm -hmm. I feel also confident in saying that there's no crystal ball, but we need to be prepared. That's our job, to mm -hmm. protect the American people. Has inflation peaked? I think probably, um, but look, if I had said that a year ago, mm -hmm. you know, assuming another war doesn't break out, assuming we don't have another COVID, assume, you know, there's so much out of our control. What inflation is being, inflation is a global problem. I want to ask you as well about um, climate. Uh, NOAA is under your pur purview. The climate agenda for the administration is completely stalled. Is the fact that you've been unable to unstick that climate agenda, but you've moved this far with chips, does that signal to you hmm. that you need to make private industry a partner in this? I would say yes, but biz much of business is on board. Like, let's be honest with ourselves. Climate-related events are more frequent, more dangerous, and more expensive than they've ever been. So do we need to do more to get business on board? Maybe, and it's you know something we are always wondering, how do we get things done in this divided political environment? Mm -hmm. But make no mistake about it, the climate investments that the president proposed are good for the economy and good for business. And, and business knows that. Madam Secretary, thank you very much for coming thank in you. and talking to us today. We'll be right back. That's it for us today. Thank you for watching. Tune in next Sunday for our first CBS News Battleground Tracker poll on the upcoming midterm elections. Until next week. For Face the Nation, I'm Margaret Brennan.